Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever you're watching this, uh, it's great to be with you. I'm Professor Yvonne Miller. I'm Professor of Design Psychology and Director of the QT Design Lab at Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia. In this morning's presentation, I want to walk through photo voice and how you might use it. Now, originally, this was to be a workshop but unfortunately, COVID has meant that it is virtual. So I am just going to, I'm constricted by the fact that we're not in the same room and also by time limitations and that I uh, am instructed to keep this under 20 minutes. So I'm just going to walk you through some tips. Uh, and of course, please feel free to reach out to me if you've got any queries. I'm very much an advocate for photo voice as a method. And I always love to connect to people who are doing or thinking about using uh, photo voice and images in their research. So drop me a line at Adifon PhD on Twitter. So had we been in the same room, I would have asked you to do a bit of an icebreaker with each other and talk about, you know, what brings you here today, but also as a way to think about images differently, to talk about the screensaver on your phone. And you can see uh, that has, that's my two kids, my two daughters there. So images, I think, they do communicate something and each of us will have a different image, perhaps as a screensaver. And perhaps as, as are the case in one workshop I conducted, you don't have an image saved at all. And that definitely tells us something about you. When we think about photo voice, the, define it is quite simply the combination of photography with voice. It is a participatory qualitative research method where you ask research participants to take photographs on a specific topic, one that you want to use those photographs as a tool for advocacy or for communication or for change. Okay, and it involves, it's very collaborative and participatory, so it involves research participants producing their own photographs as a form of data collection. It is, as Patricia Levy uh, argues, a form of arts-based research, or ABR. It is emotional, evocative, provocative, illuminating, educational, and transformative. It was introduced to the wider, broader public probably nearly 30 years ago now by Carolyn Wang and Miriam Burris, uh, who did a project in China. And they defined photo voice as a way to have a community to reflect on strengths or concerns, to promote knowledge or critical dialogue through discussing the photographs and to release to reach decision makers and advocates for change. And its theoretical underpinnings are very much about the Freerian beliefs of critical consciousness and empowerment, of feminism, and it is, uh, part of a rich history of participatory documentary photography. If you were to read one book only, I highly recommend Amanda Latt's book in this space, uh, Photo Voice Research and Education and Beyond. Now there are three main steps in photo voice, and quite simple really. First, ask participants to take photographs of things, places, processes or people that are related to your topic under investigation. Secondly, ask them to talk about and share their thoughts about why they took their photograph. And thirdly, hold a public exhibition to communicate these findings. Now, Amanda Letts has identified eight steps, uh, which you can see on the screen here. Very similar um, in terms of identification, invitation, education. And education is really critical in that we often need to have a good conversation with the participants about the ethics of taking photographs and issues about safety. And of course, though, Amanda Latz reminds us that part of the allure of photo voice is flexibility and that you can mix these steps up. Uh, and some can be repeated depending on who you're working with. So had we having a workshop, I would say to you, okay, as a group, let's have a chit chat about what strikes you as the most challenging and how we would overcome them. So you might want to have a think about that. When you think about your project, which is the part that you think might be, have the most headaches? I want to briefly share some lessons from some projects that I've done that have included photo voice. Uh, and mainly my research is focused with older people living in residential aged care. So in that, uh, the first project I did in uh, 2013 was a pilot project putting cameras in the hands of older people in aged care and asking them just to take some photographs of their daily lives. And we then printed out all the photographs on a wall gave everybody sticky dots and then they voted for their favorite images and then those were in the exhibition and at that in that process residents also selected their pseudonyms so the name that they wanted to have next to the photograph and they collaboratively themed them so we came up with this theme called frangipani's friendship and football 
Um, we use the process that Wang and Barris called showed. Uh, what do you see? What's happening? How does this relate to our lives? Why does this issue exist? And what needs to be done about it? And just as you would any other qualitative data, we themed and grouped these images, as you can see here. Now, what's striking here, I guess, is that there's not that many negative images. You know, and sometimes when we think about aged care and residential aged care and nursing homes, often the narrative is, you know, predominantly negative, but there are no or very few negative images here. And we have to remember that photographs are, as Pilt Journal argue, socially constructed. They represent how people want to be seen by others. Um, and this is how our participants wanted to portray their life in aged care. You can see here our ethics, which was extremely layered, okay? We had people consent to taking photographs and then they wanted their name or different names. They wanted, um, which they wanted to be shared publicly or internally and how they wanted to be named. Um, I'm gonna skip through some of these, but one, um, because I don't have the time today, but in the second iteration where we had more time and we structured the, the task with older people in aged care, we got much more deeper instruction, deeper images. Uh, we asked them to take, to record their life for two weeks with highlights and lowlights, and then actually to also take a photograph every hour while they're awake. And some of my favorite photographs are here. Bottom right is Patrick's fave day of the week, uh, Scrambled Eggs Wednesday. And you can see the photograph's a little bit blurry, it represents you know, his ability to take photographs. Um, so it really captures that daily life, the ritual and the experience of aged care. Uh, this is a photograph that Matilda, uh, of Matilda's. It's an angel uh, that she has in her room and she talks about how when she left home she entered hospital and then she went straight from hospital to aged care and she never ever got to go home again to say goodbye to her uh, possessions uh, her children did it all and there was a garage sale it was extremely stressful but the one thing she wanted the one thing that made her feel at home was having this angel and this angel with her um it really is the importance of narration as well. So that's the captions you put with the photographs. So this shows Knitting Circle uh, and it's an activity that the participants loved. But the narrative here is Elsie's narrative about how actually when she was at home, she actually considered suicide because she was just about, oh, I'm awake, I'm alone. Every day is the same. I just open my eyes. I'm another day, you know, darn it. Since she's been in aged care, she's got crafts to do, that kind of thing, and she looks forward to tomorrow. So kind of the opposite of what we would think, perhaps. So you can see that different photographs and narratives are more intimate. So this is, whilst it looks like just a photograph of a cup, you know, a mug on a vanity in a bathroom, there isn't explained that it was a signifier of independence for her because not all residents were allowed to have kettles in their room because of safety and risk concerns, but she was. And so that's why she took that photograph. Um, we found actually that photographic literacy in these older aged care residents was quite limited. Um, and of course, there's considerations of power and vulnerability and not really that critical and they wanted to be in the photographs. Uh, so we engaged a professional photographer to take uh, some photographs as well. And you can see the value of that in that the photographer has, has, a, has a really sharp eye. And we had a massive exhibition about this uh, where we brought people together um, and shared all these photographs with the public, which was wonderful. Uh, this is June's photograph. It's her mother's clock. It's on the wall. It doesn't keep time at all very well. Uh, it just goes off at random times. And June knows and she says, oh, is that you, mum? I love you. Thanks for visiting. She knows it's her mum thinking of her when it goes off at those random times. Oh, this is balloons for Carol. So this is a photograph that staff took. So Carol was, uh, when she died, she was, it was hard for staff because she was a much loved resident uh, who was a massive football fan. And so they let go, they released some balloons in her memory of Brisbane Broncos, maroon and gold colours. Uh, with one last tease, a blue balloon for the rival team, uh, the Blues. You know, here's some images of our opening. You can see that it brought together older people, staff, their families and the community to have this wonderfully reflexive conversation about what is it like to in aged care and how can we improve it. 
I'm going to go through really quickly now because I'm conscious I've only got a few more minutes. A second project we used was our care journey and it was life as a carer. It was a younger cohort and we gave them instructions to be a bit more creative um, because there were some projects where people have taken photographs of text messages. We haven't had that, uh, but those could be wonderfully creative ways to convey things. So here you can see that we asked them to be as creative as possible. And we used a lot of creative arts here where we co-designed an app and we brought in a cartoonist and a uh, illustrator to share some of these uh, findings. So here's an example of one photograph. Uh, a carer talks about the highlights of caring for a 92-year-old grandmother as they play Scrabble together, but a low light is designed an environment and these steps are a barrier uh, to mobility. Um, one carer took this photograph to say, it's tidy, never. Um, and then we used some graphic design, so that never ending cycle of washing. And we had a wonderful digital exhibition, which brought it to life. Uh, and as I said, we used an illustrator uh, to sketch this image of life as a carer, where everything is just on your back, including the cat and the laptop, just the load. It's just, you know, really, it's a lot. Uh, we co-designed an app as part of this project, some more images, and you can see the digital images. This is when life, when the home becomes a hospital bed, one side of it, as you can see on the left, it's a sketch of a normal bed, and the other side is a hospital bed. It's just a real challenger, challenge. You can see love and the caregiver's actions of the photos they took. Uh, this is an older woman, uh, a mother-in-law who lived on her daughter-in-law's property, and she labels um, all the meals she cooks for her. Uh, but the challenge of home maintenance. This is us with participants celebrating. And I really, I guess that's the main message with Photo Voice. It's about sharing the stories and the narratives of your participants in a really different way, in a way to hopefully enact change. Um, it's the power of the image. It's the power of a photograph that's memorable. Like hopefully you might forget all that I've said, but you could remember, I hope, perhaps that image of Scrambled X Wednesday or June's clock on the wall or the angel that goes with and told her it's always with her or a photograph that reminds you about what's important and you know why you are still doing the work that you are doing in terms of advocating for a specific group. So photographs are really powerful. Uh, and I encourage you to integrate them and photo voice into all your research methods. And I'd be more than delighted to have a conversation with you if you need any, any resources or any kind of tips about how to do that. Uh, thank you.